Commissioner, thanks again for, for the time. I guess I want to first off start and just ask, you know, with, with everything schools are dealing with right now, what's what's the top thing on your plate? What are you most focused on right now? The 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 big challenge that we have is how to make sure that we are um, given all of our children, all five and a half million souls in Texas public schools, the absolute best chance to grow academically in character and otherwise. And when you think about the disruptions of the last two years that schools have faced, they have been tremendous. Um, the the uh, current third graders were at the end of their first grade year in March when um, all of our schools temporarily shut down. And their entire second grade year was um, very abnormal. Um, and you know those are very important formative years in terms of the academic growth of, uh, of our young people. I'm a, not just a commissioner of education, I'm a dad. I've got four, four young kids. My oldest happens to be a current third grader. And so you think about at the end of your third grade year, you're supposed to have memorized your times tables and your, you know, where your uh, writing um, skill is supposed to be at. And uh, just as a dad working with my own kid, knowing, um, knowing some of the gaps that she has and thinking about that then as commissioner of education for all five and a half million kids in our schools, the, the challenge of accelerating the rate at which we can, um, we can deliver good content that we can help um, inspire young learners. This, this, is, this is the difficulty to try to make up for some lost time. No, that... I makes sense focusing on the, the student achievement. And real quick, just for what it's worth, moving forward, if I have to, to cut you off at all, I'm sure you could talk about education for days, uh, but because of the time I might, might speed sure. it up. Um, one thing I wanted to touch on too, when you talk about achievement, one of the things that's been a, a serious issue is staffing. Uh, a recent survey found that 66% of, of Texas teachers had looked at quitting over the past year. Could, could you or TEA be doing more to show that you support teachers? Yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, our strategic plan, um, the, the number one priority for us as an organization is what we do to help improve our ability collectively to recruit, support, and retain teachers and principals. The single most important in-school factor um, in, in the success of students is the teacher in the classroom. So, um, so we have made very significant investments to try to improve both our ability to recruit um, new folks into the profession and to retain those that we have. Um, uh, over $120 million, for example, just recently invested in um, work to help uh, districts improve the ability of, for them to grow their own um, talent to become teachers. The work to retain teachers um, uh, is, is pretty critical and involves you know, pay and working conditions. There's been very significant increases in teacher pay in Texas in the last several years. Um, and then also the work to provide flexibility to, as you, uh, because you're, you're, you're seeing, you're seeing some that are sort of short-term issues related to the pandemic. As people are COVID positive, they have to stay home for a few days um, um, uh, in, in, until they're, they're negative again. And so the work to try to give flexibility on substitute teachers and on the way um, uh, 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 districts can sort of organize their campuses to, so, that, um, so that teachers um, aren't overly burdened um, in the work. This is, this is critical. So we're very much focused on um, really every sort of tactic and strategy that has been identified to show promise and pr uh, in, in improvement in both retention and recruitment. Beyond, you know, the pandemic, beyond pay, there's also politics. And I'm going to give myself credit for pointing the, the three P's as issue. I mean, we had uh, nearly a dozen superintendents step down um, here just the past few months here in North Texas. And a lot have cited politics as a, as a reason behind that. Does that concern you at all? Yeah, I mean, the, the, it is a very difficult job to lead a school system. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Um, it's a difficult job in the best of times. Uh, and the last 24 months, given the disruptions and really every the way that um, America works has been has been challenging for a lot of our school leaders. But even in normal years, there's about a 14% turnover rate in superintendents. Um, and so the, uh, at, with 1,200 school systems, that's a, that's a decent amount of uh, new leaders that come and go any given year. We, we remain focused on supporting our, our, our school leaders to try to grow leadership capacity, um, uh, to, to grow the talent um, uh, uh, of folks that are leading our school systems. That's um, uh, a key work stream for us here at the agency. Um, and, well, just, uh, just real quick, I mean, it's not even just, you know, over the past 24 months, certainly there's been a lot of issues with COVID. Obviously, there's, there's turnover every year, but 
I mean, superintendents and, and teachers alike are saying that politics in schools is worse than it's ever been. Maybe I'll phrase it differently. Do we have too much politics in schools right now? Well, um, in a local school district, you have a locally elected school board. Um, and those that locally, I mean, I was a former school board member in Dallas. I, I ran for office twice. Um, uh, that is a, a, a political process to get elected. Um, so um, in a, a democratically controlled uh, set of uh, school systems, it's that it's that board that is really in charge of the local school system. Um, and so, you know, it is it is very uh, difficult as a school board member um, uh, to um, to be able to prioritize the, the most important things for kids. We think that is important um, uh, that the work that school boards do to um, focus their systems, their schools on on how to improve outcomes and learning for, for children. Um, uh, that's that's the work that school boards need to be focused on. And it's sometimes easy um, uh, to, to get distracted because that work is quite difficult. Um, uh, but um, uh, but it's important to remain focused on what the students need us to be focused on. So it sounds like not a yes or no. Um, I'm sorry, not a yes or no to what? To, to if there's too much politics in schools right now. I mean, that's what that's what we're hearing. So I just want to to make sure that I, I ask it. Yeah, I, I'm, again, the um, in a system of uh, locally elected uh, uh, school boards, the the school boards are in fact in charge of those local school systems. Um, and so that's, you know, what we have the, the local elected officials, um, that's their, their yeah. role. Gotcha. Yeah, they are, they are nonpartisan, but I guess I get what you're saying. Um, supposed to be, um, more than a half million, we talk about COVID for a second, cause that's what we started with. You know, I was looking at the numbers the other day, more than a half million students at this point, one in six staff members have tested positive. We had a lot of staffing issues as a, as a result of that, which we brought up. You know, did the TEA do enough to protect students and staff over the past couple of years in your mind? Uh, we have done a, a huge amount. The state of Texas has really done a huge amount um, to ensure that we created the safest learning environments possible. Uh, and in fact, the data uh, bears that out. The school is likely the safest congregate setting to be in throughout the pandemic. The, um, uh, uh, the sheer volume of uh, uh, what the, you know, the phrase is PPE, personal protective equipment, the, the, the work to provide the, um, the best medical supports and health supports, significant expansion of school nursing uh, and the like. Uh, I, I, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but something like 85 million uh, individual sort of uh, distributions of, of, um, of, of PPE. So you think about the, the stuff that is used to keep uh, employees safe um, while they're there, the, the work that we do um, related to public health. It's, it's, been a, it's been a robust investment in making sure that schools um, are safe. And in fact, they have been, they've been safe throughout the crisis. Gotcha. Yeah, I won't. <laughs> I don't have the time to go down that that road. We interviewed uh, Dr. Hinojosa recently about uh, obviously masks, you know, and you can distribute the PPE, but if districts are, are banned from, you know, requiring them, uh, it's kind of like a, a one size fits all was the the concern on, on that front. Um, beyond pandemic, beyond staffing, um, you know, the other issue, as I talked about, was, was politics. Um, going back to that for a second, I, I'm just curious, do you have a a one or two sentence definition of, of critical race theory, because that's a term that it feels like it's become increasingly loaded over the past, you know, couple of years. The, the, um, I think the easiest thing to do is to look at actually what the law says. So um, Senate Bill 3 was passed in the most recent legislative session. Well, it doesn't so say we, critical race theory in it, does it? Uh, no, it doesn't. And this is the, the, the reason why there's a great deal of media attention on, on that phrase. But it's, it's actually important to remember what schools are obligated to do. Um, and so the, um, what schools are prohibited from doing, for example, is to, 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 um, to teach or to train staff that any one race is better or worse than another. Um, uh, uh, the, the law uh, uh, um, says that schools should not, um, should not teach that hard work um, is inappropriate or in, in some ways a racist idea. The, um, the were schools, law says that were, were schools law, teaching that one race is better than another. The um, uh, the the I will, what I will say is that you've got nine thousand schools in the state of Texas and three hundred and fifty thousand classrooms, and what happens any given day in any given classroom can vary. And I think that um, you, you have um, school leaders around the state that work to make sure that they create the most um, um, 
positive learning environments for all of their kids that serve, serve a very um, diverse base of students. You think about the, again, the five and a half million souls that are in our um, schools, they uh, have huge, huge differences in backgrounds. Uh, and we want to make sure that public school is a place to serve all of them um, uh, effectively. I want to talk for a second also about books. I mean, I think it's in that same sort of vein. The, the governor had asked you, the TEA, to investigate pornography in schools. What have you guys found? So one of the roles that TEA has is an, an investigative function. So as complaints come to us, um, uh, we have a, uh, a, uh, a duty to make sure that the uh, laws of the state are being upheld in schools. Um, uh, while we conduct investigations, we generally don't comment on, um, on them uh, because there's still fact finding happening. After, however, an investigation is done, all of the investigative reports are published. Um, so um, uh, uh, I think you'd have to, to check for any closed investigation on that subject. I'm not sure um, if, if those investigations have been completed yet, but once they are, um, you should have full access to uh, all of the investigative findings. So, so far, nothing, nothing's been finalized, discovered and, and closed, correct? Everything's just done. Uh, yeah, it just depends on which investigation you're talking about, because there's any given day, there's, um, you know, dozens and dozens of, of ongoing investigations that could be. No, I think people would be really interested. Yeah, to know if there was uh, you know, child pornography in, in schools. Um, book banning in that same vein is, is something that's come up a lot more. We actually just did a meeting last night uh, here in Collin County where, where some parents were trying to ban it, close to 300 books. Um, is book banning a good thing in your mind? Well, it's, you know, school is a place where you want to nurture the um, the minds of young people. Uh, and it's important for uh, young people to be exposed to a um, a, a steadily growing degree of complexity um, uh, and diversity perspectives. But, um, you know, it's really the role of, of educators and in fact, parents to help um, uh, sort of guide students through that uh, journey. Again, I'm a dad, I've got four young kids. There's um, concepts that I'm, I want my kids to learn now. And there's concepts that I want my kids to learn sort of later um, uh, as they're, um, as they, as they develop. So, um, the the um, the ultimate decision for the instructional material that kids are exposed to while they're in uh, in their classrooms, or the uh, library materials that are um, uh, uh, purchased in their schools, those are ultimately the purview of local school boards. They make the decision as to the the standards and procedures that are adopted in 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 their local um, context and in their local communities. And so, there have been debates for a hundred years on um, uh, you know what content is appropriate in in schools and and that will continue. It's a it's a healthy function of our democracy to have those kinds of debates. Um, what's what is the content we want to make sure that we're um, exposing students to and when? We, we've only had a couple of minutes, and I want to make sure I, I touch on student achievement because that's what we started with, and I think that's the most important thing at the end of the day. Um, the star test is obviously always under scrutiny, but especially lately. Why not just cancel it, or, or why not make sure that that the results, especially this year, aren't used for anything other than maybe an internal review? So uh, the, the STAR test is, is important as a resource both for parents and for educators. So you know, you, we think about the, the set of expectations that we have for third graders. We In Texas, we have the moral belief that all third graders can learn and achieve at high levels, and it's not abstract. We think that third graders, for example, should have memorized their times tables, among a variety of other things. So the STAR test is really the, um, the one summative assessment that is designed to tell parents and teachers whether students have mastered those concepts. It's not designed to tell you why, it's not designed to give you an, sort of a specific action plan. It's just like, are the children at grade level? Um, and so it's, this is important for parents to know uh, after all of the uh, work that has happened over the course of the year, where their kids are at so that they can then figure out as parents the best way to support them. Same thing for teachers. After all of the uh, hard work of the year, um, uh, how well did our students master the breadth of third grade content, fourth grade content, fifth grade content? So you take that at the end of the year. Does it, um, from a student's perspective, uh, if a student does really well or, or, or really poorly, the, there's no aspect of state policy that is punitive. The, students, um, the, 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 the STAR test is essentially, there's no stakes for kids on it. Um, but it is important for us uh, to take that as a measurement um, uh, perspective so that we know how to, as adults to best serve those students in the next year. And la last thing real quick, um, I know you guys have given a little bit of leniency to districts this year, but you know, we've already heard from several who are saying, you know, we can't hire bus drivers, much less teachers or, or substitutes, tutors, 
um, for, for the required you know, tutoring for students that, that fail the STAR test. How is that going to be looked at moving forward? I mean, districts are saying this is just a, an overwhelming burden. Yeah, the, the legislature um, uh, looking at the, um, the, the real significant impact to students um, academically gave students a new right um, uh, in this last school year, which is I think as a parent is a very important um, new right, which is to say that if you're struggling academically, you have the right to access free tutoring over the course of the year. This is a very important improvement <clears throat> in how we will support students who are struggling academically, but it's not easy to implement. Um, and so there's a, um, you know, we have 1200 school systems around the state. Some of them were very well positioned in terms of how they organize the, their staff, how they organize their schedules um, so that they can offer that kind of tutoring effectively to, to their kids. And some um, are still scrambling to fill positions and, and um, work to find the tutors that they need. Um, this is a difficult new um, uh, obligation on schools, but it, again, is a very important right for parents and for, for kids. So I know the legislature will be studying the specific requirements um, of that law and, and potentially adjust uh, to make sure that we have the, the most sort of student facing um, uh, public policy framework that we can, to, um, because, you know, a kid only gets one shot at first grade. It's our obligation to give them our absolute best. Thank you so much, Commissioner. I really do appreciate your time. You take care. Thank you.